to get started, I want to take you to a place that may seem very familiar to you. This is a place, and I want to I have a little uh, photo for you that might just help you with this trivia uh, experiment. If we could move on to the next photo. Now, <clears throat> this is a place of about four million people. Uh, there are two main cities here uh, of about a million apiece, give or take. And in comparison with the rest of the country, this place is known to be conservative and religious. There's a populist streak here, along with a long-standing cowboy culture. The oil and gas industry plays an outsized role, and as such, the place suffers from boom and bust cycles. It also has a very visible and strong indigenous heritage. What am I talking about? Alberta, yes, that's true, and? Somebody said Oklahoma. Where's Texas? No one yells that. Well, you guys are so smart. This is unbelievable. Last, I, usually when I do that joke, it's like everyone goes Texas. But whoever said Oklahoma, congratulations. Yes, we're talking about Oklahoma. Thank you. Um, and anytime I, can, I, anytime I can sort of say something bad about Texas, I take the opportunity. Because I'm an Oki, by the way. I, uh, I'm an Oki, but I'm an adopted uh, Alberta as my, as my, my home. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, so right. So there's there's two right answers, Oklahoma and and uh, and, and um, Alberta. But more to the point, we often hear this notion that Alberta is the Texas of Canada. It's not. Oklahoma is Alberta's doppelganger. And if you want to keep an eye on a place with a parallel reality to Alberta, a place with on a heavy diet of UCP-style tax cuts, austerity, Oklahoma, and not big, bloated Texas is the state you should look to. Do you want to see Alberta's future under a socially and economically conservative regime? Let me take you on a tour. Our tour begins here on, a, on a, uh, uh, the side of a highway in Tulsa, where a grade three teacher panhandles for money to buy essential school supplies like markers and paper. After 11 years without a raise, she's been forced to beg. Four straight years of budget cuts have pushed her to the brink of quitting. Entire school districts have resorted to four-day school weeks to save on energy and personnel costs. Teachers post photos of frayed textbooks Crumbling infrastructure, a teacher exodus ensues to places like Arkansas and Texas, places not necessarily known for high wages and good conditions for teachers. The next stop on our, on our tour is the Tulsa County Jail, where a paralyzed and mentally ill veteran is left on the shower floor. Guards watch for three days until the inmate dies, turning a medical cell into what the ju judge later called a burial crypt. Severe overcrowding in the jail means that some cells measuring 10 by 10 are occupied by three inmates, leading a public defender to warn of an impending human rights crisis. The next stop on our tour is the dry western half of the state, where wildfires burn out of control. Cuts to forestry services have left the state understaffed for dealing with hotter and drier conditions another scene that will be probably painfully familiar to some Albertans. Over a, a dozen state parks are set to close. A highway patrol chief announces that a potential public safety crisis due to, to the Republican legislature's budget cuts. A city overpass crumbles. Swarms of earthquakes shake a region known for gentle rolling hills and tall grass prairie in the middle of the North American continent. One in 12 citizens is convicted of a felony. The state budgets twice as much money for prisons as it does education. Sometimes it seems like Oklahoma has become America's own failing state. In the face of such circumstances, it might be tempting to just give up all hope and like Steinbeck's Joad family, pack up the old jalopy and move to California where social services are well-funded and climate change is accepted as a reality, but not so fast. I'm actually gonna sound a note of hope here. <laughs> I know it was a bummer, but stick with me. 
At a recent town hall in Tulsa, a newly elected Democrat from a blue collar district in the oil refining uh, area west of town, a man spoke. He was a lifelong Oklahoman, he told me. He worked in prisons. He was a devout Christian and a huge fan of the Oklahoma Sooners football team. But he felt like something had gone wrong in the state's social contract. How did we get so mean, he wondered to me. How did we get so mean that teachers are begging for school supplies, that nursing home residents are being forced out? It wasn't a partisan question for him. It was a question that got to the heart of the idea of a common societal good. Republicans kept getting elected, not because of the Oklahoma electorate was mean-spirited, but because the people had been swindled. It was a deal too good to be true. Governor Mary Fallon had promised that Oklahomans could have tax cuts, a trimmer state bureaucracy, back in business, right? Um, all without sacrificing essential social services. How was such a deal possible? Oklahoma had the goose that laid the golden egg, just like Alberta, oil. Is this starting to sound familiar? Well, it gets even creepier. <laughs> Fallon and her Republican counterparts had a plan. Lower the taxes on oil, on oil and gas, lower corporate taxes. This will spur production, which would in turn beget more jobs, more production, and voila, a singing economy and lower taxes for everyone. The plan got started in earnest in 2008 when Fallon took over the governorship from Democrat Brad Henry. Let's see how the plan worked out. Between 2008 and 2017, Oklahoma slashed taxes on drillers and on income. The median Oklahoma household, an average income of about $50,000, saw its taxes reduced by $228 a year. $228 a year. Now compare that to the average $15,000 that the average household in the top 1% received. And here's the real kicker. Households that were making less than $22,000 a year, the bottom 20%, they received an average tax cut of $4. Yes, $4. But oil drillers fared much better. Breaks for the new horizontal wells meant that tax on oil and gas was down to a nationwide low of 1%. By, o by 2017, taxes were so low that the state's richest man, a billionaire named George Kaiser, was practically begging the state legislature to raise his taxes. No matter, even though many Republicans actually wanted to raise taxes, none would risk voting for a tax hike with the prospect of getting primaried by another candidate even further to the right. So what did Oklahoma get from this massive transfer of wealth? Until recently, Oklahoma had fallen to number 59 in teacher pay. And uh, I like to say the, official, the unofficial state motto is, thank God for Mississippi. Because um, uh, Mississippi's, we still got that higher than them. Spending per pupil declined, uh, decreased 23.6 percent between 2008 and 2018. The state led the nation in spending cuts to education for four years in a row, a dubious title. Entry level employees with a high school diploma at the popular convenience store Quick Trip earned more than teachers with a university certification. The teacher exodus led to emergency certifications for teachers with no training in education. The four day school week hit working class families the hardest as now many families were having to decide between uh, childcare and going to work. One teacher told me she had to move back into her basement, her parents' base, basement apartment even though she had two small children of her own. She just simply couldn't afford rent. But it's not just education. The real moral lesson here is how fragile our social fabric is, even in a place as oil rich as Oklahoma or Alberta. Once you start tearing at it, all sorts of other things come undone. Oklahoma, for example, has a popular support program for uh, people with devel developmental disabilities. It allows parents of disabled children to take off work 
to care for their children or parents. Well, it now takes 10 years just to get on the waiting list. Not, not 10 years to qualify, 10 years to get on the waiting list to get one of those waivers. That means that Oklahoma Health and Human Services is now considering applications filed before 2009. Of course, a lot of those people, the cruel irony is they're dead by the time they actually um, qualify. The state is down to three inspectors for all the state's nursing homes and as many as one quarter of nursing homes may soon close. So um, Oklahoma has also experienced the lowest, the slowest growth in life, in life expectancy from, two, from 1980 to 2014 in at least one county life expectancy has actually declined since 1980. That's even with the de declining smoking rates. Meanwhile, we lock up more people than any other jurisdiction in the world. This is an incarceration rate of, of Oklahoma, if it were um, a nation. You can see it's about 10 times as many people locked up as Canada. So all of this has led to increased apathy. Uh, Wallet Hub re ranked Oklahoma as the least civically engaged state in the union. And as much as I hate to say this, because I have many dear friends and family in the Republican Party, I think conservatives want it this way. I think they want us apathetic. I, I think they want us to be mean. I think they want us desperate. Because once you get desperate, you start looking for villains. And in Mary Fallon's second term, beginning in 2014, more tax cuts led to more pain for, more, for, the, for the poor and the middle class. The, the Republicans started to identify those villains. They weren't the tax cuts. They weren't the oil and gas executives. They were migrants, immigrants, queer people, religious, ethnic minorities. The legislature passed some of the most draconian anti-immigrant bills in the nation during this same period. Oklahoma pa politicians passed a ban on Sharia law being used in the state's courts, courts, courtrooms. Had anyone ever tried to use Sharia law in an Oklahoma courtroom? No, of course not. But the Republican majority in this budget crisis decided to pu push through a bill mandating the phrase, one nation under God, be displayed in every single classroom. Now I know my Canadian audience, you're probably thinking, Oh my goodness, those crazy Americans. Well, I know we got our problems, but at least we don't have that gong show down there. This is my favorite gif, summing up this attitude, right? Just kind of retreating behind the curtains and eating the ketchup chips. And I know Kenny has tried to differentiate himself from Trumpian populism, especially regarding immigrant, Im immigrant populations. Loves to go have curry and dim sum and dance. And I think there's a tendency to think, well, it can't happen here. We're the kinder, gentler version of the states, and maybe it won't. I hope it won't. But that's not because we're going to retreat behind our domains and snack on ketchup chips. Because the seeds of cultural division are sown through policies that exacerbate inequality. And when these tax cuts lead to cutbacks in social services, people look for scapegoats. It doesn't matter how many times you sit down for dim sum or curry or celebrate multiculturalism. If Alberta takes the same path as Oklahoma, with a frayed social network, people will turn on each other. The rise in hate crimes this province is already witnessing bears this out. Now I call this phenomenon the toxic two-step. Feel free to use it. It's uh, not a Garth Brooks song, although he is a native Oklahoman just like myself. Uh, step one is you hand out the tax cuts. They mainly benefit the corporations and the rich, but you promise that better days are ahead for the working class, for the poor. And we talk about the, con we've already talked about the consequences. Schools start to fall apart. Many of my childhood friends, for example, um, staunch believers in public education have started taking their children out of public schools. They simply can't uh, afford to put their kids into such a damaging environment. I mean, these emergency certifications, there's been all kinds of abuses by teachers because they don't, they don't have the proper training. Um, you don't know when school's going to be in session. Uh, <laughs> you know, may not be there on Friday. And so uh, well-meaning people, uh, you know, not necessarily hardcore Republicans, are taking their children out of public schools and saying, we've got to put them in private schools. Well, guess what those private schools cost? 
On average, they cost $12,000 a year. But remember, you got an average $224 in your pocketbook. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, so as public, as public schools fail and the social network phrase, we turn to step two in the uh, toxic two-step. The average tax cut in 2016, there you go, uh, $4 for the lowest, for the lowest uh, 20%, $16,000 for the top 1%. Then you start blaming the other, right? When this doesn't translate into higher wages and all the wonderful things that you thought were gonna materialize, you blame other people. More anti-immigrant, more anti-LGBTQ, more paranoia in the political class. Oklahoma passed another birther bill, the outlawing of Sharia law. And at one point, and I'm not even making this up, a prominent legislature proclaimed that the biggest social problem in Oklahoma was, and I'm gonna just quote, rampant lesbianism in public schools. <laughs> yeah. Demonizing the other, however. <laughs> yes. It didn't grow wages, talking about rampant lesbianism in public schools, did not grow wages, did not improve the student-teacher ratio, but nothing seemed to work. So, with all else failing, the governor issued a call to prayer, a statewide call to Christian prayer, more, more uh, particularly. Um, she said that October 13th from now on would be oil field prayer day. Quo and I'm quoting, I'm not making this up. Oklahoma is blessed with the abundance of oil and natural gas, allowing the state to be a prosperous producer of these valuable resources, and we are to quote, thank God for the blessings created by the oil and natural gas industry, okay, by the industry, no, not by the actual bio, or the actual natural processes that left that carbon in the ground, um, but by the industry, and to seek his wisdom, God's wisdom, and ask for protection. The same day of oil field prayer day, October 13th, first one in 2016, a small earthquake hit the town of Cherokee. Maybe God had something to say about Oklahoma after all. Now, to conclude, I said that I was gonna end on a hopeful note, and I said it's a toxic two-step, but we need to go from some, somewhere from here. We're stuck, right? Unfortunately, there's a way out of this dance, but it doesn't come from the traditional outlets. The teachers' union, God bless them, for example, they were caught flat-footed but when a small Facebook group turned into a mass movement for better wages and conditions in schools. The Democratic Party, God bless them, struggled to articulate a coherent vision that was not Republican light. And these institutions, however, are starting to get the message. This is the teacher, a scene from the teacher walkout. This was last, Last spring, teachers walked off the job and occupied the state legislature. They said that, said that this was one of the biggest crowds outside of an Oklahoma Sooners football game anyone had ever seen in Oklahoma. Um, it is illegal to strike in Oklahoma, but Oklahoma teachers mobilized through a huge grassroots movement and it managed a partial victory. Now, I know it's not the victory that a lot of people wanted, but it was a partial victory. Teachers finally got their first raise in 11 years. 11 years. And it also led to other movements in West Virginia, Arizona, Kentucky, other, other conservative, very conservative states. We saw a reinvigorated movement. Polls in Oklahoma still show that people support public education. 81% of Oklahomans said they would forgo tax breaks if the money would support public education. 81%. Oklahoma, like most of the Great Plains and the Canadian prairies, is often labeled solidly conservative. But the single biggest upset from the 2018 midterm elections actually happened right here in Oklahoma. Um, it was a place in suburban Oklahoma City, and no one saw the victory of, of Democrat Kendra Horn, herself a former teacher, coming. No one saw, no, not, she defeated the Republican incumbent with virtually no support from the National Party. 
538, those geniuses, those data analytic people didn't give her a chance. But how did she do it? Well, first of all, she avoided talking about Donald Trump. She talked about this basic swindle at the heart of the Republican revolution. She went back to the state's grassroots. She talked about social agrarianism and progressivism. And Democrats who have won in Oklahoma have done so by embracing a working class solidarity. It's not for nothing that Oklahoma actually has its state motto, labor omnia vincit, and that's from the Latin, labor conquers all, labor. Not capitalism, not free markets, not, auto not oil and gas, labor. Now, in this reddest of red states where Trump beat Clinton by 36 points, a public sector-led movement redefined the state's political landscape, as we see here. Even though Republicans still held on to most statewide offices, they are no longer calling for more tax cuts, which is kind of ironic that now this, we have a government here calling for these, these, this same magical thinking. The state, uh, Oklahoma is now, wages are, are, are going back up. Uh, the state is being, this rainy day fund is being replenished. And after two years of budget failures, a handful of national embarrassments and a national walkout by teachers, a mass walkout by teachers, Oklahoma has moved the needle. And that, I believe, is, the, is my hopeful lesson for Alberta, my new home and adopted land. That even in the darkest of times, an appeal to basic fairness can go a long way. But how to cut through the layers of well-funded propaganda campaigns, big lies, as Gil said, um, and hate-mongering on social media and right-wing fake news, that's a harder question, and one we will all have to grapple with in the years ahead. Thank you.